All right, so good afternoon and welcome to another Security Compass webinar. Today's webinar will be on maintaining software security during code changes. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Raquel Rodriguez, the Events Manager here at Security Compass and your host for today's webinar. Before we get started with the actual content, I'd like to give a quick overview of Security Compass. For those of you who may not be aware of us until today, welcome. Security Compass was founded in 2004 and began with a team of experienced penetration testers. Today we have come far and work with many large enterprises globally to manage their cybersecurity risk through balanced development automation. We have three key offerings. Our flagship product, SD Elements, enables organizations to deliver software quickly and reduce costs through automation. Our modular role-based e-learning solutions empower organizations to embrace DevSecOps and our strategic advisory services offer expertise in cloud security, pen testing, and red teaming for better security posture. Let's quickly go through some housekeeping items. As you might notice, you have all entered the session on mute to reduce background noise. Second, a recording of this webinar will be available after today's event, and you will receive an email with a link to the recording. We will also publish this recording in the resources section of our website. Also, we encourage everyone to raise questions. Please submit your questions into the Q&A chat and we'll address them during the Q&A session. If after our session you'd like to follow up with us or you have a topic or a question that you would like to see covered in a future session, please email us at contact at securitycompass.com. Like I mentioned for today's webinar, we're going to take a closer look at maintaining software security during code changes. I'm pleased to have here with me Altaz, Director of Insights Research at Security Compass, Lofty, Assistant Teaching Professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, John, Cybersecurity Leader and Evangelist, and Simone, Principal Consultant at Microsoft Consulting Services. Altaz, Lofty, John, and Simone, thank you for being here with me today. I know our audience is keen to hear your presentation, so I'll let you take it from here. Wonderful, thank you very much, Raquel, appreciate that. And welcome everybody, thank you for joining us today. I think before we get started uh, with our uh, webinar today, talking about secure code changes, perhaps it might make sense to give a little bit of insight into our panelists here, uh, so you get some idea of who they are. Um, so what I'd like to suggest is we'll start with John, go to Simone, and then Lotfi, if you can provide a bit of your background. So a quick 30 second rundown, John, if you wanna get started. Um, sure. Thanks, Altez, and and thanks to everybody for for joining us here. This is this is a pretty cool deal. Um, code security is is like it's just number one. We got to get we got to get in front of this stuff. Um, about me, I've I've been doing this um, for many many years, way too many years to count. I started back in the days of of polyphonic te telephony tones, and and. You know, progressed into you know Lisp coding and and all that stuff through the years. Uh, more recently, I've been uh, leading some of the Safe Code efforts and on the Safe Code uh, Technical Council, um, and have published oh I don't know it's somewhere around 20 white papers over the last few years um, around fundamentals of coding, um, fundamentals of code secure code and and all of that stuff. My work in Supply chain has gotten uh, recognized in 2016. Um, what do they the what what do they call that uh, the change change guru or some do, some some award thing? Um, you guys look it up. So I'm just pleased to be here. <laughs> Wonderful, that's great. Good to have you, John Simone. If you could give a brief introduction to the audience about your background. Thank you, thank you, Altas, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Simone Curzi principal consultant from uh, Microsoft Services. And uh, I am uh, uh, both an application security expert and a threat modeling expert in particular. I've been with Microsoft for more than 20 years now, and I have uh, uh, had experience in development uh, and uh, then the last five years uh, entirely devoted on security. Uh, I'm also the leader of the internal community for application security in Microsoft. Uh, and um, I will uh, leave to the next one. Thank <laughs> Wonderful, you. that's great. Thanks, Simone. Lotfi, a bit about your background. Thanks. You're on mute. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Artes, for organizing this event, and good morning for everybody. Uh, my name is Lotfi Ben Othman. Uh, I actually started in the industry about 24, uh, 25 years ago. And uh, for the last 10 years, I have been doing research and also teaching software security uh, for about 10 years now. Uh, I'm teaching now uh, at uh, Iowa State University in US. Uh, so um, I started initially um, the topic of software security I was included in a project and I was asked to take care of security. So whatever you can do. And actually it was cyber physical system and it's not possible. So we have really to make things uh, secure before giving the system uh, to the users because it's very dangerous. Uh, so this is how I got to security. I have so far about 50 publications, uh, peer reviewed publications. Um, several in uh, high journals, um, high level journals. Um, so this is basically uh, my, uh, my background. Wonderful. Thank you, Lotfi, for joining us as well. So folks, we've got a combination today of people who are from academia, people from industry, and this is something that Security Compass believes very strongly in. We need to get the diversity of perspectives out there. Um, there are clearly some, uh, some things that are being stated out there in the industry that we need to contend with, but we do it in a way that's respectful of where people are coming from, what their backgrounds are. Why is it that people think, you know, you know in terms of certain aspects of security is, is you know, some of, the, some of the themes like those will, will probably emerge in our conversation today. Uh, so the whole idea of looking at, at security from the perspective of the code, life cycle and specifically when we change the code how do we ensure that we continue to retain the integrity of the software is a critical component we hear a lot in the industry today about rapid movement let's get this let's ship it out but the minute you get that first piece of code shipped out now it's all about maintaining that code you're going to add things you're going to remove things you're going to change things so if we're going to do that kind of a model this idea of managing security during the code change life cycle becomes really, really important. So the way we're going to unfold this panel discussion today is initially, uh, what we're going to do is share a slide based on the research that Lotfi and his team have done around secure code changes. So if Lotfi can speak about that, then what we'll do is we'll open this up as a panel discussion. And we'd like to make this as interactive as possible. Raquel mentioned we've got a Q&A channel. If you've got any questions, don't hesitate, put it in there. Please, let's treat this as a forum where we've got people who are of like minds, um, you know, at different levels from different perspectives. So please feel free to inject your thoughts into this discussion as well. So to get going, what I'm going to do is I will share a slide here uh, based on the research that Lotfi and his team have done. Uh, Lotfi, are you able to see my screen okay? Yes, I do. Okay, why don't you go ahead and uh, explain this to us? Yes. So uh, thanks, uh, Altes. Uh, I actually, as I said, I started about 10 years ago to work on uh, developing secure software in a team. And uh, I realized it myself that is, it's, that is a challenging to ensure the security of the, uh, of the software, of that software. Uh, first, the project, they are uh, developed incrementally, as Altes, you said. So we added pieces. Then we deliver the code after a few weeks, we deploy the code. Uh, the, uh, the second thing is it's costly to review all the code. It's not possible to review all the code even. So we need to focus on, uh, we need to focus on specific aspect, mainly uh, only the, uh, the portion that are changed. But it is known that if you change the code, then potentially you can break the other features that you might have in your system especially if you are using some cryptographic things, uh, you can really mess up with things, um, uh, with those mechanisms when you change. So um, then we thought, uh, how developers and security experts solve this problem, this problem of maintaining the security of software, uh, the security of software when they change the code in an effective and efficient way. So the default is you do uh, the code again, you, uh, you make the assessment of the software again, and you are done, right? But this is not efficient since you have to do the, uh, everything. 
efficient one would be that you can capture the portion that are really um, of concern. So um, we interviewed uh, 11 developers and security experts in US in, uh, and in Canada in different industries, such as the banking system, software engineering system, control, um, system control systems. And uh, the slides kind of capture the main aspect that the interview they talked about. So they talked about their uh, own processes on how they capture that there is a change, how they get the approval, whether they are gonna change a portion of a code or not, how they assess the risk of the, um, of the change that they need or the study that they need to do. Uh, they have also a set of uh, assessment activity like code review, like code analysis. And different companies, they have different assessment activity that they practice with. So, uh, but um, also um, each companies, they have uh, their own um, security aspects that they are concerned with. But mainly all of them, they are concerned with dependency vulnerability when they deploy a software, especially it's open source, and it is known that there will be a vulnerability in this, uh, or uh, there, there are vulnerability in these software. So uh, identifying those problems and trying to manage the situation, so that is critical. Uh, the second is the authentication authorization. It looks like from these interviews that uh, the uh, security expert uh, have problems with those, with those mechanisms. And uh, the third main aspect is the OWASP top 10, like the buffer overflow, the things that we are coming with. So uh, this organization also, they, uh, they really consider these, uh, these aspects. Uh, the main challenge that uh, we found that our interview we have with uh, changing uh, software, secure software, are the diversity of the security issues we have big number of security issues and attacker come all the time with a new, a new ways on doing attacks and the security expert needs to be up to date on these, uh, on these issues. So that is a concern. It's difficult to, uh, to get the knowledge and actually to do, the, to do a code review or uh, to apply that to the software that they changed. Uh, the second is the effectiveness of the, um, of the tool. So, um, most of the interview, they reported that the tools, they, um, they have a lot of false positives. So how they would address that. And uh, the uh, last main aspect is that these tools, they ignore also the human factor. They do not consider the human factor. They focus only on the technical aspect. Human factor here like collaboration and uh, having things easy for them to, uh, to spot the issues and so on. So um, I'm glad to be here and to contribute to this discussion about the main um, maintaining software security for code changes and to listen to the panel and the different and the attendees on their experience in the topic and their concerns. And thank you again, Altes, for the support. Sure, sure, not a problem. So this this represents the culmination of the research that you've done after interviewing, after looking at what people are writing about. And uh, so I'd like to just, you know, put this, leave this on the screen for just a little bit longer. And I'd like to invite the panelists now who are from the industry. So John and Simone, if you take a look at this, um, there are a couple of questions that come into mind. Does this confirm what you are seeing from the, the, the practical implementation of software security? And uh, you know, are there areas in here that maybe have not been captured that you were also seeing additionally that might be able to, to help us understand this a little bit better? So perhaps what I'll do is I'll point to you, John. Do you have any additional thoughts on this? Uh, I've, I've got a lot of thoughts on this. Um, <laughs> thanks, Altes. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and I think that this is, is a fairly accurate sort of internal view, uh, internal development team view of what they do of what they're doing, how they're, how they're reacting to, to certain types of vulnerab vulnerabilities, P certain types of vulnerabilities. Um, but this is also um, has some, some gaps then, and those gaps are why we, why we provide those developers with things like checklists and, you know, SANS lists of vulnerabilities and, and OWASP lists of vulnerabilities. Um, 
because the fact is is that that after after everything is said and done roughly 35 percent of the software is being published still has you know higher or greater criticality vulnerabilities right mm -hmm. so so once it gets out in the wild then what happens well sometimes those vulnerabilities go unexposed throughout the entire life of the product and that's sort of from a, a salesperson's point of view, that's sort of the ideal scenario. Um, from the the other part of the time is that that those vulnerabilities become known, and once they become known, once some tester you know figures out that it exists, or worst case that it's a zero day, um, then that product suddenly is compromised in the wild, um, and and that becomes a real issue for the development teams. They've got to go back and do a number of activities, right? They've got to say, is, is, this, is this in the library that I've included? You know, something like 91% of, of all software has you know, open source and third party libraries in it. Um, is this a library that I've used? Is it, is it a critical library that I've used, right? Um, is this, is this application security control type of library or right? an ASC type of library? And if it is, is the severity of this problem, you know, ramped up? Do I have other activities to it that I need to now do from an executive level? Do we need to issue alerts? Do we need to go through those sort of social things um, that need to happen? So, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of of activities that happen outside that development team. The team yeah. itself really needs to focus in on, does this impact my threat model? Do I have a good threat model first? <laughs> and second, um, I, I think that the number is somewhere around 50% of, of, of groups are doing good threat modeling. What they, they self-identify as good threat modeling. Um, I don't know if that's how good that good actually means mm -hmm. but but if they are let's assume that they are and now they have a, a product security incident response activity a p-cert activity so is the, is that does that mean that the threat model was defective does that mean that the the development um prioritization in, in reaction to that threat model, was that defective? Is the process defective there somewhere? So, so there's a lot happening outside the team and on the periphery of the team. And that, that again talks to you know, some of the stuff that, that certainly this group has talked about a lot around training and knowledge and, and you know, how we implement um, mm -hmm. the, the products that we're, we're Pushing, pulling together, pushing out the door, and the environments that those are happening. Because you know, at the end of the day, it's all code. So, absolutely. So I, absolutely. I I love I love this 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 relationship diagram, um, but I, I I think we need to have it in context. Yeah. So we take a look, and we've got, for example, security development processes that take place. And and usually, when we look at that, it should not be an isolated activity. But we've got various other teams that contribute towards the addition of that security. And, and at the end of the day, when we look at it, our objective is how do we go in there and provide the necessary assessment capabilities uh, for, for teams to be able to go and suggest that we have in fact done what we thought we should have done from an assurance perspective. I'd like to ask Simone, uh, Simone, do you have any thoughts on, on, on what has emerged from the research so far, speaking from an industry perspective on this? Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, thank you, Altas. And uh, unfortunately, we do not have hours <laughs> to spend on this. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of there are a lot of considerations. First of all, uh, I will say that this represents a part uh, of uh, a secure development life cycle. What we should expect, for example, from something that will be um, in line with uh, ISO twenty seven zero three four. Uh, we should uh, really expand a little, and there are uh, various parts uh, that are missing. 
perhaps Lofty was uh, starting to introduce a little them uh, by talking about the human factor. One of them uh, has been introduced by John, threat modeling. Here, threat modeling is really not so represented. And give, from my point of view, given my experience, uh, what I can say, say is that while threat modeling is definitely one of the most effective practice uh, that uh, should, that is adopted to uh, improve the security of the solutions, it is also one of the less known and uh, one of the most frequently adopted in the wrong way. So it's uh, extremely frequent to see organizations doing threat modeling and really doing that in a very bad way, poor way. There are a lot of reasons. That's not the, the, the goal of this call. Uh, but uh, there are quality, even in security, is, uh, is a factor. When we talk about uh, quality and what we can see in current uh, practices, there are uh, some considerations that come to the, to the mind. For example, the references. Uh, it's uh, interesting to note that one of the uh, main references uh, that we have about standards, about security um, issues that we may handle and how to handle them is the OWASP top 10. And uh, <laughs> Lofty introduced this and it was not random. Uh, it's, uh, it's really every single customer I work with uh, asks for uh, being uh, for solutions to be secured and and to be and they refer explicitly only to OWASP top 10. Uh, there are some that are starting to improve their view, but really that's extremely limiting. That's uh, like uh, looking at the top, the tip of the iceberg. And uh, while it is definitely true that uh, a lot of uh, attackers will focus on those uh, type of, of attacks, it's also true that uh, uh, if you have a persistent attacker, you will not uh, be able to block them if you focus only on the WASP top 10. Mm -hmm. It's definitely true that uh, we should, uh, in the industry, be sure to cover at least the basics. And uh, this is also aligned with the concept of due diligence. Due diligence uh, is uh, what you achieve by doing what you absolutely need to do to achieve uh, at least an uh, acceptable level of security. But uh, uh, that due diligence uh, may be a lot, to, may, may involve do a lot more than covering only a WASP top 10. And uh, um, I will say that uh, requires to have a good understanding about the security characteristic of the solution, starting from the, uh, identifying the security requirement and uh, uh, then evaluating the design of the solution by using uh, tools like threat modeling. And here I'm not talking about tools in terms of software that you can use, fire and execute. Uh, threat modeling is a, a process, a practice that helps uh, you to achieve a good understanding of the solution about its risks and what you can do uh, about them. And it's totally independent uh, from the tool that you can use. In, in any case, uh, I will say that uh, uh, it, securing the solution is a matter of uh, achieving, uh, of adopting not only tools, but good processes. So th this, is, uh, this is fundamental. And I would uh, uh, add to that, uh, uh, that, that currently we are having a lot of focus on uh, uh, toolings, uh, which uh, from my point of view is not necessarily a bad uh, approach. I know that with John, <laughs> we have some differences in this and, and uh, uh, I will leave to him to, to introduce the differences. But, what I've seen is that uh, uh, you don't need to achieve uh, uh, typically uh, a perfect security. Perfect security, total security is something that is only ideal. It's not achievable. You need to uh, make the risk acceptable 
for your organization. That's only what you need to do. So to achieve that, uh, depending on the type of uh, system and type of solution on what uh, you are doing, you may uh, require to do a lot of things, but uh, even adopting checklists may be something that could uh, help you to achieve that result. Because a lot of attacks are basic things. What we see, yes, we see a lot of compromise uh, in organizations. So my, my structure also work, works a lot in helping customers in uh, recovering from this, this sort of, of compromise. And a lot of, in a lot of cases, we see that uh, the basics are missing. So to address that, uh, you don't need to implement a perfect process for security. You need to do the due diligence, you, to do a, a good job uh, in uh, uh, securing the solution, covering the basics, and uh, you need to understand when you need, when you need to, to step up to get additional assurance. In that case, of course, you need to be able to adopt threat modeling, uh, whatever is required. Mm. That's interesting. So thank you both for providing your thoughts and your input on this diagram. What I'm going to do now is let me flip. And uh, what we'll do is uh, just real quickly, we'll open up a whiteboard. And um, I think as we're opening this up, Raquel, if we could put up our, fo our first uh, polling question on this, um, and it would be interesting to see what the audience kind of where they where they sit right now, what are their thoughts around security automation or things like that. So please feel free. Uh, <clears throat> I just provide your thoughts on this and, and uh, let's see where, where everybody sits at this point. Uh, and in the meantime, let me see where I can bring up a little whiteboard where we can continue the discussion that we're having here uh, on, on the whole idea of, um, of doing things around security at this point. So, uh, so far we've got a few individuals that have responded. We've got mostly uh, we don't automate security checks and we've got a few people who do automate. So um, let me turn over to you, John. Does this surprise you at all to see that we've got folks that uh, mostly, you know, we've got the people that aren't doing it. It's not a representative sample, but just, just in terms of what we're seeing right now. Well, so it's concerning. I'll, I'll just put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing I want to happen is that your company, um, you know, you're publishing stuff and someone else tells you that you have a security defect. Um, that's, that's often a resume causing event. And, and we don't want that. that. That's a bad thing. And it's, you know, it's, I think it's more personal than that too, depending on the type of software. Um, a defect can, can impact the lives of the users very, very directly. Um, if you've been on webinars with me before, then, then you know that, that I'm, I'm fairly passionate about how things like ransomware and, and you know, those, those types of viral attacks uh, impact normal, normal everyday people. Um, one, one close friend of mine uh, had she she digitized all of her photographs of her dead husband of her family and all of that stuff and through a ransomware attack she lost all of that oh. um, and the, this stuff impacts not just you know, our businesses but it impacts our, our people our friends our families as well so i i tend to get a little passionate about um, undisclosed and undetected vulnerabilities, especially, if, uh, you know, depending on severity, obviously. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But, yeah, yeah. I, I, just, I just don't see where good enough is good enough. Mm -hmm. So as we talk about secure code changes, there are several themes that have emerged even in the discussion we've had so far. So we've talked about vulnerabilities, we've talked about things like threat modeling, We've talked about things like risk. So I guess what I'd like to do is, Simone, can you talk a little bit about secure code changes and what's the tie-in with secure code changes and risk, right? So we've got a team, yeah. say they're in a DevOps environment. Now, suddenly we've got this idea of risk, which may be foreign to many people who are in the DevOps pipelines. 
you know, can you talk a little bit about that, the, the connection? Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think also that uh, it's uh, quite linked with uh, the last uh, John comment around uh, uh, good enough, uh, because, you know, the concept of risk, uh, one of the simplest uh, representation of that concept is how much you can lose as a result of uh, uh, a vulnerability. So uh, what may happen and uh, what you may lose. And that this uh, is uh, something that can be measured. And there are ways to measure this uh, uh, loss uh, in uh, uh, using monetary terms. Uh, there is a methodology called uh, FAIR. I cannot recall every time. Factor ed, uh, I'll task. I think you can help me factor there. Factor analysis, because... yeah, factor analysis. Thank you. Information. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I will not remember that one. Uh, <laughs> there is no hope from me, for me. So. <laughs> Um, but that approach uh, is wonderful to understand what are the risks. So uh, the code changes may represent a risk and may also address risks, depends on what you do. So uh, for example, if you have a vulnerability in your solution and uh, you know that because uh, it's a code vulnerability or it's a design vulnerability, then you identify something can, that can be done to mitigate that vulnerability. And uh, that's usually what you call uh, a, a mitigation. Uh, and uh, this has the intent to lower the potential risk. But it will, in general, it will not uh, uh, zero the risk. You may have uh, a lowering of the risk uh, uh, in general because, first of all, everything you do represents the risk as well. So mm -hmm. if I, for example, if I, for example, change some piece of code that, that could have uh, uh, a, um, a um, uh, SQL injection by putting some validation activity, that validation code could be vulnerable as well. So that's uh, lowering in a way the risk, but uh, it's also making the risk a little higher due to the additional code that I have uh, implemented. And uh, the balance, uh, hopefully, will be something that will be in our favor. So will make uh, uh, the potential loss lower. Uh, so from my point of view, uh, you can uh, achieve an acceptable risk. And this is definitely our intent. Our intent is not to zero the risk. The only way to zero the risk is to remove the functionality. So if I, I don't have a solution, instead of having a solution, of course, I have uh, a, an infinite difference. Because if I have the solution, I have a risk. If I don't have that solution, mm -hmm. uh, that the, the related risk will be zero. Mm -hmm. So, but this is not achievable because you, you need to do that business. So you needed to have that solution. So you needed to make the best that you can, making the risk uh, as low as possible. And this means that you need to make the risk acceptable. Because every time you do things, every time you implement uh, a mitigation, every time you find a way to lower the risk, you are spending money. And uh, at the end of the day, you need to have a balance between what you spend to reduce the risk and what is the potential loss. So from my point of view, if you have uh, a vulnerability that could cause uh, a loss, for example, of a million dollar mm -hmm. and uh, your mitigation is costing two million dollars, it is perfectly reasonable to avoid going that direction and to accept the risk, right? So uh, I would say, I, I will put have answered your question. This will be Absolutely, absolutely. So let me, let me just turn this around a little bit. And so we've talked about risk and measuring the risk factors, really driving towards low risk, but it's this balance that you talked about, right? Balancing the development and even a lot of the automation that we do against uh, how do we uh, look at the cost side and look at the risk side. But it, what's interesting is you brought it from the business perspective, right? This isn't a technical endeavor now. When we construct our code and when we start to measure risk, it is all based on what 
are the factors that are riskiest for the business. And it implies now an understanding from the development community around how do we bring in discussions on risk that are pertinent to what the business is looking for. Uh, I'd like to, to pivot the conversation just slightly because we generally use threat modeling as a means of trying to identify what that risk actually is. And uh, I would like, Lotfi, from your perspective, um, as you've spoken to people around threat modeling, have you found that there are common techniques or, or common scenarios that people generally take a look at in, in threat modeling, or has this not emerged as of yet? So with, the, with respect to the study that we've done on secure code changes, it is alarming to view that uh, many of the interviewee, uh, they already, they are not familiar with, uh, with threat modeling. Uh, often they are trained on uh, using code analysis tools and uh, writing new checks. Mm. And they, uh, they believe that uh, in their view that the security is actually the result of the um, addressing the issue reported by code analysis. So even for the training, we know that uh, we do not train uh, software engineers or developers to develop secure software. And companies, they do their part or they do the job in training them, but basically, they got a tool, they use it, and they believe that this is secure, and they don't do threat modeling. It's only a few people. Uh, mo mostly, they are security experts that they talk about threat modeling. Uh, coming to the threat modeling, so we are currently doing another study related to threat modeling. And we are seeing that, I think, for we've done seven so far, uh, seven study, probably we got also seven techniques that people, they, um, they use. So everyone uses their own ways, almost. So it's not one-to-one, -one, but it's almost uh, every company, is, they use their own, uh, own technique for, uh, for threat modeling. So to answer your question, that obviously also impacts the results because if you use different techniques, then potentially you're gonna get different results, right? So um, that is of, uh, of concerns. So, um, yeah, learning, uh, getting familiar or um, having the developers get familiar with threat modeling and apply that, apply the logic of risks. It is very important so far. Uh, the risk is based on the severity that those code analysis uh, tools report, uh, whatever the severity that uh, whoever develop the check for that particular vulnerability, put the severity, let's say one, two, or three, they use mm -hmm. that and it's done. And that is probably not, not everything for, for the concern. Considering especially that uh, based on the, uh, on the study that we have for secure code changes, uh, some interviews, they reported the authentication authorization issues. And these, they are not gonna be uh, caught by current code analysis tools where you have checks like uh, SQL, um, SQL injection and so on. So it's not the same category of, uh, of issues. So if they are not familiar with threat modeling, they're not gonna detect that potential. Yeah, interesting. It's interesting you bring up this idea now of familiarity, which to me implied, if we're not familiar, then there's probably something in here related to training or some something that maybe perhaps uh, that is a gap in their understanding. Uh, I'd like to flip over to you, John. Uh, I know you've done some work with Safe Code around training, around secure development. Um, any thoughts on this idea and trying to bridge this gap with familiarity and training? Uh, you know, what, what are you seeing? What, what are you hearing out there? Um, that's that's huge. Um, first, first, can you can you hear me? Okay, I I had yes. one system crash, and so I I'm now on one of my dev boxes. Sure. <laughs> so, Loud and clear, John. Okay, awesome. So, so so we can't manage what we don't know, right? We can't we can't take into account the factors that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. We can't we can't work with unknown unknowns. It, it, we just can't do that. As professionals, 
And, and so what we tend to do is ignore them, right? And we tend to say that, that because I've got to get this product out the door, because I'm on a timeline, because I've got, you know, deadlines and, and, and management expectations that I've got to, to manage somehow, right? I've got to manage my manager <coughs> that, that I'm going to do things the way we've always done them. I may have a checklist. I may have some sort of thing. But if I've got something, let's say I'm using some form of automated testing, and it comes back and says I've got a medium risk vulnerability, my job is to report the vulnerability and move on. Mm -hmm. Right. The, the benefit of ad hoc as needed training, and I, I'm a huge proponent of this, is that the developer can get right in their IDE more information on this on this vulnerability if they're they're doing C plus let's C plus plus let's say they've got a uh, a buffer management issue right well the smart training says and the smart tooling says it's on this line it's in this way to fix it and by the way here's the best practice on how to fix it here's the impact if you don't fix it um, that's that's huge training for the developer and as they work in an environment that features that, that sort of ad hoc training, that sort of as needed delivery of training, they get smarter, their team gets smarter, and they sort of start moving towards that, <clears throat> that blue ribbon sort of viewpoint of a security champion. Mm -hmm. I know that everybody on this call, we've talked about this a bunch. So, you know, the, the idea of security champions is, is a huge thing amongst a development team. You know, if you've got four people, six people, 12 people in a dev team, um, having that security focal there that's part of our team, it's a huge thing. And that goes back to the expertise in threat modeling. If your threat model does not include, most threat models, by the way, that I've seen our teams do, says we've got a network access to this, to the software, and here's the network attack vectors. And that's not a threat model. That's mm -hmm. just a wishful diagram. Mm -hmm. right? um, a threat model, and, and, and I know, Simone, you talked about ISO 27034, and I think that that's a brilliant lead on how to do a threat model. Um, ISO 27034 talks about application security controls. It talks about those things that are absolutely inimical to good software development. Yeah. I agree. Uh, so, sorry, John, go ahead. I've got an audit standard coming up, I hope, in the next six months. We shall see. Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I noticed we've got a few comments here in chat. Let me just bring this stuff out. Um, we'll take a look at this. Um, Let's see. Uh, so if we take a look at any questions on the Q&A side, how, so this is a question that came up. How do you measure risk quantitatively? Okay. Uh, so, so Simone, did you have any thoughts around this? Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, there are various uh, methods. Uh, I know in particular of one, which is uh, that uh, FAIR methodology mm -hmm. uh, that I was talking uh, about. Uh, FAIR uh, is uh, a methodology designed by people belonging to a company called the Risk Lens, and it has been standardized by the open group. Uh, so we have a methodology called Open FAIR. Essentially, it is based on the decomposition of uh, the of scenarios, of attack scenarios, uh, by identifying very cl clearly what are the uh, different aspects of those scenarios, who can uh, execute the attack, uh, what type uh, of uh, um, damage will be performed, uh, meaning what type of data will be involved, what type of elements will be considered, and then uh, it will decompose uh, uh, the actual risk in uh, um, direct and indirect uh, risks. Direct are those issues that uh, th those uh, losses that happen directly uh, for the attack. Like for example, you stop working or you need to 
engage someone to analyze uh, the attack and to understand what uh, happened uh, and you need to recover and these sort of things. Absolutely. Indirect insta- instead uh, are the activities that you need to do because someone has been damaged as a result and is returning to you to ask for compensation. Uh, it may be uh, um, due to some regulatory, um, due to some load, so some, so you may be fined for that. So there are different uh, elements that will fall in this case. Uh, typically, indirect risks are uh, uh, not immediately, do not immediately happen. They, uh, first of all, not, not only you need to be compromised, but also you need that to be done in a way that is recognizable by a third party and then everything, uh, then the risk will happen. So by combining those risks uh, together and you and essentially gathering information from uh, uh, people in the, na- in the know, uh, in the organization, you are able to identify various estimations uh, uh, in uh, monetary terms that you combine using some Monte Carlo methodology and you get finally an analyzed loss expectancy uh, for, that, uh, for that risk. So that's in a nutshell the, the approach. Yeah, I don't those, know, Altas, Do you know other? Yeah, no, no. I think I think I think no. It makes sense. I think uh, uh, for sure there's um, you know for folks that might be interested in understanding a quantitative way of analyzing risk, uh, please feel free. You can go to the Fair Institute. They've got some work there. The Open Group has some work that they're doing. Uh, they're developing the standard on on fair. Uh, there should be a revision uh, coming out shortly that they're working on right now. Uh, but uh, yeah, there are uh, many different kinds of, of models that are out there. Uh, this just happens to be, one, to be one that's focused on how do we assess risk uh, when it comes to analyzing uh, information systems. Um, others that might be interested in other standards that are out there that perhaps are auditable, you might want to check, uh, check out um, what ISO 31000 has on risk management, which is very high level. And you can take a look as well on uh, what is happening with uh, ISO 31010, which is a standard on risk assessments specifically. It gives you various techniques. Uh, Simona just put in the chat, you can go to simonasecurity.com. Feel free to go in there, peruse the stuff that's there, uh, see what is available. Um, and just it gives you some idea of how you might be able to go and, and talk about this from a, from a risk perspective. Uh, please do keep the questions coming in. Uh, we'd like to continue to, to uh, answer anything that, that perhaps is important for you in, in what you're doing in your day-to-day work right now. Um, I have one more question, and then perhaps what we'll do is we'll see if we can and slowly uh, try to bring this to a land. Uh, and it's this whole idea that we've got here around vulnerabilities. So when we look at vulnerabilities and, and look at secure code changes, we can introduce vulnerabilities. Now, the question, of course, is the, vulnerabil- the vulnerabilities and the tie into measuring the risk factors. We want to be able to try and drive the number of vulnerabilities as low as possible. Um, but when we take a look at it, and in light of emerging threats that are coming out, that I believe it was John that mentioned it, uh, you know, we have to be diligent about how we're managing these kinds of vulnerabilities. So, John, I'm going to ask you a question to just talk a little bit about the vulnerabilities that we see and the secure code changes that we've got, you know, the tie in between the two. How do we how do we manage the vulnerabilities, but do it in a way that doesn't, first of all, interfere with the speed that we're looking for in a code change code chain cycle that tends to be iterative and very rapid. But how do we at the same time try to look at it um, from the perspective of quality? So just those mm-hmm. couple of different angles on this, John? Absolutely. So, so the best the best way to accelerate software development is to not have code changes at all, right? Um, every time we've got to go back and and redo something, it's not just the time taken to redo it. It's the time to get set up. It's the time to talk about it. It's the time to have meetings over you know which vulnerabilities are which which code changes are we going to make this cycle? What are we going to put off till next cycle, right? And then how are we going to to do all of the, you know, publication of those changes that we've got to make? So it's, 
it's not just the vulnerability itself, although that's 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 the challenge. Mm -hmm. It's it's all of the things around it. So the the number one goal should be to write perfect code the first time. Simone is absolutely right. That's impossible to do. I get that. But nonetheless, that's got to be the goal. Um, so, so now we're in the situation where something is published. Somebody comes back and says, you screwed up. How are we going to fix this? Right? And, and now we've got to go through that cycle. We've got to do publications. We've got to do all of that stuff. Yeah. That's, that's the least optimal way to do secure code. Right. I think here, John, also we have to remember that when you change a code, uh, that software probably is a library, is a dependency for other software. And, that, and the customers, you don't know how the customer are using your own software or your own library. You potentially going to break their own software and that dependency really makes things. Right. So we've got now we've got a full on cycle of regression testing. We've got to do all of that stuff in addition to vulnerability management. Right. Right. So let's say that we're just doing pure cloud development and deployment. Right. That's sort of that's become kind of the simple case in, in the world today um, because there's less variability about how it's being published. Um, so so let's just say we're doing pure cloud and and I've got potential impacts on all of my microservices. I've got potential impacts on my deployment scripts. I've got potential impacts on, on the new browser updates and you know that, that sort of cycling, you know, moving target on, on what the browser is going to be doing. Right? So, so it's not just about the vulnerability, Lofty, you're absolutely correct. It's about all of those things around the vulnerability as well. So the best way to, to, to manage vulnerabilities is to don't have them in the first place. Uh, Simone mentioned the FAIR model, and FAIR model is wonderful at, at saying, what's my top-down risk? What's my, how, what's my look into the environment that I'm building to be able to do some sort of quantifiable risk analyses and, and dollarize that? I, I think the FAIR model does an excellent job of that. Our challenge is, is as in the weeds kind of people is to say, how does a single vulnerability impact that fair model, assuming we're using it? Yeah. And that's a real challenge. That's, yeah. that's a difficult mapping exercise, just so you know we've done it. And it's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and therein lies the opportunities to determine now, you know, so to what was mentioned earlier, we need to mitigate and so mitigating, we've got to consider the cost. And so what's the cost of doing it against the benefit that we're hoping to accrue uh, from that type of analysis? Well, it looks like we've pretty much come close to the top of the hour here. Time just basically flew by in this conversation. I'd like to turn it over at this point to Raquel uh, for any closing remarks or if there are any additional uh, comments that she may have to add on this. Raquel? Sorry, I was on mute there. Um, I think we can maybe get to one quick question before we wrap up. Just um, again, I'll also remind you that if there was any questions that we were unable to answer, you can email us at contact at securitycompass.com. Uh, so the first question that we have here is, can you talk about security getting in the way of software development teams? I can take a first crack at this and then I'll invite the panel to comment. Um, so the idea that we've got uh, security getting in the way, it's, um, it's a theme that is out there in the industry right now. Um, and if we look at it and kind of play the scenario out, if we don't have security in the discussion, the challenge before us then is we will end up creating software without the necessary guardrails. Uh, and so this is where risk enters into it. Uh, so anytime we've got multiple teams that need to talk about their perspectives, we will necessarily find that there will be areas where we are used to doing things a certain way, but we have to now consider some different perspectives into it. I think we have to be careful here not to single out any specific community, for example, security or compliance or legal or privacy or any of these areas, they're all important. 
And what, what I'm seeing, at least from my perspective in the industry, as we look at where standards are evolving, it is more and more now about getting these diverse perspectives so that when we go forward, um, you know, not, it's not just about the vulnerabilities to, to what Simone has been talking about. It's trying to reduce the number of vulnerabilities that we are hoping to, to, to have once this thing goes out. Um, so it's really trying to do it from that perspective. So while there is this, this sort of, uh, you know, conversation thread that's happening and it comes and goes, I would caution against just wholesale taking that and saying, oh, okay, that means security, you know, is, is always going to get in the way. I think we've got, we've got to, to sort of take a step back and look at it from the perspective of what business value is every team adding as it pertains to um, ideas around risk, for example, and that therein lies the value proposition. But I'd, I'd open it up, you know, to the panel. Feel free to disagree, you know, your thoughts on this as well. So, so <laughs> one of the things that I, I truly hate about, about modern computing security or uh, cyber security dudes is that, that we tend to be like helicopter parents. You know, we, we kind of fly in, we, we parent a little bit on these, on our development teams and we fly off and, and the development teams are going, what just happened? We got this list of things to go fix. We've got no time to do it. We've got no management directive to go do it, but we got to go do it in order to publish because the helicopter parent said so. That's, that's just so wrong in so many levels. And we've got to, we've got to fix that. I believe that I truly believe that the best way to fix that it's with a program like a security champions program. What that does, that brings in expertise into the development team. It's a permanent fixture of the development team because it's one of the, the developers, right? It's one of these people that, that know what they're doing, understand what they're doing, hopefully with the lead in that team. And, and they're now responsible for the outcomes. And that, that seems to make a big difference. We also make executive management responsible for the outcomes. That makes a difference as well. So mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, let's, let's not be that guy. Let's not be helicopter parents. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, Raquel? Perfect. So I think that's all um, we'll be able to get to in terms of the Q&A. But again, if there was any questions that you wanted answers, please uh, please feel free to reach out to contact at securitycompass.com. Um, but Altaz, Lofty, John, and Simone, thank you again so much for a great session. Just to let everybody know, we do have webinars lined up for the next few weeks. So if you're interested in attending any of these, please go to the upcoming events and webinar section on our website to sign up. We hope everyone found this presentation insightful. And again, we will be providing a link to the recording of this webinar to everyone here via email. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Stay well and safe and have a great day.